Okay, so I wrote a script and made a video about the history of Dr. Seuss, and then decided that it was too long and that the audio didn't sound right. So I decided to do a short video about Dr. Seuss facts that I couldn't fit into my main video. And now I'm re-recording the audio for my initial video to make it shorter. So basically what I'm trying to say is that a lot of work went into this video, so I hope you enjoy it, because by this point I really just want to get this done. Now, I actually don't like reading biographies that much, because they can be kind of boring, especially when referencing a person's early life, because I mean, let's face it, children really aren't that interesting. I'm sorry to all you parents out there who think that your children are the most interesting things in the world, but they're not. Dr. Seuss's biography, on the other hand, is anything but boring. I mean, how many 14-year-olds out there can say that the ex-president of the United States gave them stage fright? Then again, America does currently have a really great ex-president. I guess we're going to have to wait until Trump is impeached and then see what kind of trauma he inflicts on America's youth. Wait, wait, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Born in 1904 in the American town of Springfield, Massachusetts, Theodore Seuss Geisel was the youngest child of Theodore Robert Geisel and Henrietta Geisel. Main name, Seuss. And yes, I know that this name is not actually pronounced Seuss, but the German pronunciation is, is way too hard to say, so I'm just going to stick with Seuss from now on. I mean, I looked up how to say his last name, so I should get points for that, right? One of the first big dark spots on Seuss's otherwise happy childhood was the start of World War I. As I'm sure most of you already know, after America entered World War I in 1917, citizens on the home front started to suspect their immigrant neighbors of being spies. This, of course, was bad news for young Theodore and the rest of his family, as due to their German heritage, their social standing within the town took a serious nosedive. Theodore, or Ted as he shall henceforth be called, was bullied and ridiculed to the point where even years later, the memory still haunted him. To counteract some of this animosity, Ted's grandfather bought $1,000 worth of war bonds from young Ted, who was selling them on behalf of the local Boy Scout troop. And this was 1918, so $1,000 was quite a substantial amount of money. I think you could get a bottle of Coke back then for maybe 5 cents, so think how many bottles of Coke that could have bought. Though I'm not sure whether or not at this time Coke was made of actual Coke, so maybe that wouldn't have really been the best idea. As an added bonus, his grandfather's purchase made Ted one of the top 10 sellers in his troop, an accomplishment that came with the benefit of being awarded a medal by none other than the former president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Unfortunately, what was supposed to be a happy and self-confidence building event for Ted turned out to be arguably one of the most scarring experiences of his life. You remember how earlier I said that Dr. Seuss developed stage fright after an unhappy encounter with the ex-president of the United States? Well, thanks to a mix-up courtesy of the Boy Scouts, during the ceremony, Roosevelt was given only nine medals, despite there being ten winners. After Roosevelt had handed out all the medals, he found that there was still one young boy waiting on stage. Instead of, I don't know, calmly asking one of the scout leaders about the situation, he decided to instead scream at the top of his lungs, What is this little boy doing here? If you haven't already guessed, the little boy was in fact young Ted Geisel. In the end, Ted was shoved off stage by one of the scout leaders, and he never received his medal. To add insult to injury, just two years later, in January of 1920, Prohibition became law, putting an end to the Geisel family brewing business. While this was definitely a kick to the pants for the entire Geisel family, Ted's hatred for Prohibition greatly influenced his body of work, as many of his early illustrations tended to feature drunk characters. This style of drawing may have even spilled over into his book illustrations, as his characters have been described as having a smile you might find on the Mona Lisa after her first martini. If the connection between Dr. Seuss's art style and alcohol didn't interest you, then let's talk about how Theodore Seuss Geisel developed his pen name. While you should have caught on by now that Seuss was Ted's middle name as well as his mother's maiden name, he didn't start using it as a pseudonym until his final semester at Dartmouth College. And surprisingly, the story behind why he started using it also has to do with alcohol. During his final year at Dartmouth, Ted and his friends decided to hold a pre-graduation party in Ted's dorm room, complete with an illegally obtained bottle of booze. Unfortunately, during the party, two of the guests decided that it would be a fun idea to go up on the dorm's roof and start spraying each other with seltzer water. Because when you're drunk, that is what passes for a good idea. The actions of the two boys attracted the attention of the dorm advisor, who called the police, which of course led to the discovery of the legal bottle of alcohol. As this all took place during Prohibition, the dean would have been justified in expelling Ted and his friends. 
but instead he allowed them to continue their education with all extracurricular activities suspended. For Ted, this meant that he could no longer act as editor-in-chief of the Jack-o'-lantern, the school's humor-based newspaper. Undeterred by his suspension, Ted kept submitting drawings to the paper under a number of different pen names, including Seuss. While Ted was never caught and graduated that year without incident, he often wondered if the dean or his colleagues at the paper ever caught on to his ruse. While Seuss was officially adopted as Ted's pen name, he would not become a doctor until after his stint at Oxford University. After graduating from Dartmouth, Ted decided to pursue a career as an English professor and applied for a scholarship to attend Oxford University. Despite not receiving the scholarship, he still attended Oxford on his parents' dime, after a miscommunication led his father to believe that he'd already been awarded the scholarship. Ted's father was so impressed with his son's accomplishments that he bragged the entire town of Springfield, only to eat his words later when he had to pay for his son's education to avoid the embarrassment of admitting his mistake. Unfortunately, Oxford was not an overly happy experience for Ted. He was uninspired by his teachers, bored by his classes, and ostracized by many of his fellow students. One of his more influential Oxford experiences occurred during a lecture where one of his fellow students, after seeing the doodles in his notebook, remarked, Drawing is what you really should be doing. By the way, that's a great flying cow. The student was Helen Marion Palmer, Ted's first wife. The pair got married in 1927, and needless to say, Ted never graduated from Oxford, though Doctor was added to his pen name in lieu of the doctorate he was supposed to have received. And for those of you who are wondering, Theodore Seuss Geisel did eventually earn the title of Doctor, after he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Dartmouth in 1955, which happened to be the first of eight. After leaving Oxford, the pair moved to New York City, where Ted embarked on a career in advertising. Ted's first children's book, or at least the first to get published, did not hit shelves until 1937. Unfortunately, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, the book with a rhyme scheme inspired by the sound of steamship's engine was not exactly a hit with publishers. Most of the publishers Ted visited, which according to him was quite a few, told him that books set to verse were not marketable and that his story was an insult to children's books because it apparently had no moral. Before heading home to burn the book, Ted was lucky enough to run to an old Dartmouth colleague named Mike McClintock, who, as it happened, had just been appointed editor of juvenile books at Vanguard Press. Unlike the previous publishers, McClintock saw the book's potential and agreed to publish it, but not before a few last-minute changes were made to the text, including changing the name of the main character to that of McClintock's son, Marco. And To Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street is an interesting book to say the least. While it obtained moderate acclaim when it first came out, I mean it did get a positive review from Beatrix Potter. The story's theme would come to be reused again and again in many of Seuss's other works. The story revolves around an ordinary young boy named Marco with a very overactive imagination. Unfortunately, Marco's father is worried about his son's constant over-exaggeration and wants to teach him to tone down his tall tales and focus on the truth. In keeping with this ambition, Marco's father asks him to give a report of his walk to and from school without exaggerating. While Marco has every intention of doing what his father wants, his walk to school proves to be so monotonous that his mind soon begins to wander and his surroundings transform. Eventually, the simple horse and buggy that he sees transforms into a sultan riding an elephant flanked by two giraffes accompanied by a parade. Despite the interesting story that Marco now has to tell his father, he decides to recount the more mundane version when he gets home. Was there nothing to look at? No people to greet? Did nothing excite you or make your heart beat? Nothing, I said, growing red as a beat. But a plain horse and wagon on Mulberry Street. Seuss's first narrative, not unlike many of his subsequent stories, revolves around the relationship between an adult and a child. Often in these stories, the child character, generally a creative daydreamer with big ambitions, is rebuked by an adult who, while not necessarily cruel, is presented as being much more matter-of-fact, with a desire to bring the youngster down to earth and make them face reality. Despite their best efforts, however, the young daydreamer remains unchanged, as they continue to imagine the implications of what could be. Seuss tales, such as Miguel Gets Pool, If I Run the Zoo, and of course, and the Think That I Saw on Mulberry Street, all use a similar structure. And while you would be justified in thinking that these works simply echo Seuss's feelings regarding the importance of imagination and listening to children, 
Some have pointed out an additional meaning behind these stories. Many people have suggested that Marco and his father are actually parallels for Ted and Theodore Sr., with Ted being the over-exaggerating daydreamer and Theodore Sr. the well-meaning parent that just can't relate to his son's view of the world. During an interview in 1983, Ted was asked about his parents' reactions to Mulberry Street and whether or not they would have approved of Marco's imaginative powers. And while he was adamant that his mother would have loved the book, he also stated that his father would have been critical. To be honest, it's difficult to say for sure if this is what Seuss actually intended when he wrote these books, but one thing that I do know is that Mulberry Street was the star of what was to become Seuss's most lasting legacy. Okay, so since I want to talk about the Dr. Seuss books in order, the next title I'm going to cover is Horton Hears a Who. This book has what I consider to be the most interesting backstory of the bunch. I mean, it concerns World War II, democracy, Life magazine, and the Japanese education system. But I I'm getting ahead of myself, again. Horton Hears a Who was published in 1954, but to understand the motivations behind why it was made, we have to go back all the way to 1943, the year that Theodore Seuss Geisel enlisted in the army. Now, being that Ted was too old for the draft in 1943, I mean he was 39 years old at the time. He was inducted into the Signal Corps unit and put to work making propaganda. While working for the Signal Corps, he helped to create such films as Know Your Enemy Japan, which was released August 16, 1945, the same day America dropped the atomic bombs. I, I know, I know, Dr. Seuss made anti-Japanese and German propaganda during World War II. A pretty far cry from Gerald the Boing Boing or the Cat in the Hat, isn't it? Unsurprisingly, Ted was so mortified by the propaganda he created both during and prior to World War II that in the early 50s, he and his wife traveled to Japan to do an article for Life magazine about the country's changing education system, in the hopes that it might help to shift American perceptions about the country. While the article that Geisels wrote accurately reflected changes occurring in the Japanese education system, such as the introduction of foreign reading material and the shifting focus towards individualism, the article that actually appeared in the magazine presented a much different picture. Turns out that the publisher of Life magazine, Henry Lucky, who had always been anti-Japanese and pro-Chinese, decided to alter the article's content, to distort the Geisel's intended message. Undeterred, and perhaps a little bit pissed off, in 1953, Ted began work on another children's book, intended to help teach children in developing democratic countries, like Japan, about community and democracy. The book, as I'm sure you've already guessed, was Horton Hears a Who. Just in case there's a single person currently living that is not familiar with Horton Hears a Who, for clarity's sake, let's go over the main parts of the story. An elephant, named Horton, hears a voice from a speck blowing through the air, and discovers that an entire group of creatures, called Who's, are in fact living on the speck. Being that Horton, with his gigantic elephant ears, is the only creature in the jungle of Newell who can hear the Who's cries, he vows to protect them, as he believes a person is a person, no matter how small. But a nosy and honestly very annoying kangaroo decides that she doesn't believe Horton and wants to destroy the speck before Horton's dangerous ideas can infect the rest of the jungle community. Seuss's story presents us with two intersecting yet opposing worlds. On the one hand, we have the conformist jungle community of Newell, and on the other, the democratically run community of Whoville. While the Who's do have an elected official, the story's last act is what truly demonstrates the democratic nature of the Who community. During the story's final act, despite the Who's best efforts to get noticed, the ruckus they create still isn't loud enough for the residents of the jungle community to hear them. So the mayor goes on a search through the town until he finds the only person not participating, a little boy named Jojo. In the end, Jojo's yawp is what puts the Who's efforts over the top, as their collective voices ring out from the clover, at last garnering the attention of the jungle community. Like in any democracy, each Who in Whoville has a voice, and it is their choice whether or not they want to be heard. Even Whoville's mayor, in the face of impending doom, never tries to make Jojo participate with the others, as it is his voice and he alone will decide how it will be used. The community of Newell, on the other hand, decides to work together for a completely different reason. Spurred on by the kangaroo and under the impression that Horton and his beliefs are dangerous, the jungle community decides to cage Horton and burn the speck. Unlike Jojo, Horton's voice becomes the reason for his imprisonment, as his nonconformist ideals are believed to be disrupting the foundations of jungle society. That is, however, until he's proven right. 
After hearing the Who's voices, the outlook of the jungle community shifts dramatically, as they become open to the completely new world of possibilities, such as the fact that life really can not exist on a speck. Okay, enough scholarship and symbolism, now it's time to talk about the animated movie adaptation. And just to be clear, I'm talking about the 2008 animated movie, not the short film from 1970. Now I actually tried to find all the little ways that this movie steps on the original source material, and let me tell you, there aren't really that many. Or at least not that many really troubling deviations. Sure, the film has a lot of pop culture references intended to pad the runtime, but when you're making a feature length animated film based on a children's book, you have to add filler somewhere. I mean, the original animated short from 1970 was only 26 minutes long, while the animated film has a runtime of an hour and 28 minutes. So yeah, at some point something's gotta give. And to be honest, in relation to the story, these changes, for the most part, don't really affect very much and are really just a mindless distraction. The bones of Dr. Seuss's original story are still there, but that doesn't mean that there are absolutely no significant changes. The first and most noticeable change is in relation to the story's main protagonist, Horton. Many of Seuss's characters, specifically his animal characters, were not very fleshed out, as he preferred to base them around a certain characteristic. Horton, for instance, embodies the characteristic of concern, and almost every action he takes during the story can be linked to his concern for the Who's. Because of this, Horton from the 2008 film is given a bit more character, which honestly makes sense, considering the film's longer runtime and Horton's status as main character. Horton in this version is very silly and mischievous, while still embodying the same level of concern that the character is known for. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't begrudge this Horton, nor do I hate his bubbly, energetic personality, but I don't speak for everyone. The last thing I want to mention in relation to Horton has to do with his role as a teacher, which of course was not in the book, but is very much a welcome addition, or at least in my opinion. This point in the movie makes me think that somebody at the studio really did their homework on Seuss, and that they add this part as a reference to the book's origin and how it was inspired by the Japanese education system. Or maybe not, I can't really prove anything either way. Other than Horton, the jungle of Newell and the characters that inhabit it are pretty similar to their book counterparts. They have Vlad, the Wickershams, and a very condescending kangaroo. Whoville, on the other hand? Oh, Whoville. While the changes made to the jungle of Newell are relatively harmless and even beneficial at times, the Whoville additions are decidedly more harmful, at least when it comes to presenting the original story. Now, remember how I said that Whoville was supposed to be more democratic, while the Jungle of Newell was meant to come across as conformist? Well, if that was what the writers of this movie were going for, then I think they seriously missed a step when they decided to add these characters. The Council of Whoville, apart from being the creepiest element of the movie, just serves to complicate the original intent of the story. I mean, if literally forcing someone to smile and go along with your ideas is not conformist, then I don't know what is. On top of this, the Council really doesn't add that much to the story. I guess they're supposed to be a kind of alternate version of the kangaroo in the jungle of Newell, as they both serve as obstacles to the protagonist, but unlike the kangaroo, the council of Whoville really doesn't have that much influence in the story. Sure, the council has sway over both the town and the mayor, but even if they decide to heed the mayor's advice and safeguard their citizens, chances are that not much would have changed. The town would still be destroyed by Vlad, and because this is a children's movie, no matter what the situation, they aren't going to acknowledge death. Even after Whoville is destroyed in the film, we are led to believe that absolutely no one dies or is even injured, being that no matter what choices the council makes, they ultimately impact nothing. And not to mention, in the original, everybody really knew that their world was on a spec. So no matter how you look at it, these characters are pointless. The last really significant change has to do with Jojo and the mayor. In the original story, Jojo was just a random boy, and the mayor was, well, the mayor. In the movie, however, Jojo is now the mayor's son, for some reason. The story's big climax, where Jojo helps save the town, still happens, though he uses a big noise-making machine instead of his voice, which makes me wonder, what was he planning on doing with that thing? Was he planning on deafening the entire town? But that's not the main issue here. While the big town-saving moment still happens, it doesn't feel as important because so much of the story's focus is shifted towards the mayor and his relationship with Jojo. While I don't think that Seuss would begrudge this change, I mean parent-child relationships were a pretty big part of his first book, but it just doesn't fit with the intended message of Horton Years of Who. Oh, and let's not forget that the mayor becomes closer to one of his kids, but virtually ignores his 99 other children. I mean, he interacts with them a few times during the movie, but it's not like they have any bearing on the story. 
a character trait that seems to be rather prominent in this movie. So this has been part one of my Dr. Seuss video. If you liked part one, please tune into part two, which should be materializing at some point. I honestly have no idea when I'll have time to make it. So until then, this is Silver Jade saying see you next time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.